First question, Mr. John Roche. John Roche from grad 2005. 2005, 10 years ago. Wow, ha congratulations, happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. made it 10 years. Made it. Okay, so what years did you, were you out of Spymalt for? Uh, I guess 2000, 2005? Yeah. Grade 8 to 12. Oh, you were in, in the grade 8s? Yeah. yeah. So you went straight from Rock Heights to here? Yeah. Yeah, and what was that like coming into grade 8 for you? That was very difficult. Grade 8 was probably <laughs> the hardest year of my life. Yeah, what yeah. was that? Uh, puberty, uh, mm -hmm. challenges at home, there, were a, there was a lot working against me. I didn't really know how to interact with people. Yeah. I didn't even know how to do homework at that point. So I, yeah, there was, that, was, that was just a tough year. High school's hard, I think, yeah. anyway. So yeah, grade eight was tough for sure. Yeah. I got bullied a bit as well. You got bullied a I got bit. bullied. Really? Yeah. Who were your bullies? Without naming names, just like there were there were like a few incidents with you know kids who were a few years old, like five years, you know, grade twelve or something. And, oh, pick it on uh, the grade eight. Yeah, yeah, and that was I didn't really know how to deal with bullies at that time, so right. So yeah, I just kind of got pushed around and. Yeah, were you doing okay academically at that point? No, I got no. like probably B's and C's in grade yeah. eight. Okay. Well, not train wreck, but not where you would eventually get to. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. Well, uh, when you were at Esquimalt, what was your favorite class or program? I mean, I know you entered Challenge in grade 10, didn't you? Yeah. So you had two years of regular class and then three years of gifted. Yeah. So, so favorite class? I s it's hard to say. There were there were a bunch of really good courses. I mean, probably Social Studies 11 with Mr. Dodds. That was the first year that I had Mr. Dodds. Yeah. And he was just, he really got you thinking. He really got me mm -hmm. thinking about things that I'd never, never thought about before at all. It was sort of like, I had this tunnel vision. I think most of us in our society do. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just blew things wide open. Yeah. And suddenly there was like a universe of questions that I'd never even considered. Um, and that was, that was exciting yeah. to start thinking about things like that. I wonder if that attributed to you not going into science. It's because I knew you in grade 10 and 11. Um, that's, I met you in grade 10 and you're just such a strong math student at that point that you had gotten your, your <laughs> academics put together. Yeah. And, and then you were my taught physics 11 student. I think you got 100%, maybe 99. I think it was a hundred. I, I think it was, it was my 100. one one hundred percent. I think it was, yeah. and and so I, when I, eat, I don't give out a hundreds that often, and so when I my hundred percent physics eleven student comes and tells me on the first day of grade twelve that he had to change his schedule and not take physics twelve, I was I was I I understood your reasons, but yeah, um, do you can you attribute that change? to maybe Mr. Dodds, like sort of sparking that new way of thinking that you hadn't done before? Yeah, very much, very much. Um, he just kind of opened my eyes. I mean, I wanted to save the world. That was what I wanted to do when I was in yeah. grade 12. And I would still love to save the world. My aspirations are a little humbler now, but um, I hadn't really thought about sort of structural, systemic issues like socioeconomic stuff, yeah. geopolitical stuff until uh, social studies 11 so when he opened my eyes to all that to politics and stuff yeah. he got us volunteering with local um, I volunteered with the NDP he said choose any party and volunteer with them yeah um, and he's kind of a neo-marxist I think so he just mm -hmm. really questioned things and I was like oh my gosh there's so many oppressive structures in place Are you okay yeah there's so many oppressive structures in place and I wanted to go into medicine before, which was why I was in the sciences yeah. and stuff, but I thought we got to we got to change it at the structural level. Right. Um, so that was kind of, and then I so saw I wanted to go into law, yeah. and then go into politics after yeah. that. Yeah. And then it's funny I studied history and politics in my undergrad, and then actually ended up going back to micro level change and thinking that that right. was a more effective way of producing change. So I kind of bounced around. Yeah. Well. Um I thought for sure when you were t telling me that you were going to go into politics, I, I thought, okay, well, 
future Prime Minister of Canada, I guess I'll get over no physics to all. <laughs> um, uh, were there any other um, uh, courses or, or teachers at Esquimalt that, that, that facilitated this change in career path? Um, I mean, I always liked English. Uh, so Miss Roberts, I had her. Is she still here? She is. She's on leave right now. Okay. So she's back in September. So I had her for, for English. Really enjoyed that. Um, what, what made her English class stand out for you? Again, she was, she was kind of a radical. So she'd have us yeah. thinking about, like, we did a, a unit on existentialism, which yeah. really stuck out for me. So I thought, again, it's like really asking these questions that people don't conventionally ask themselves. You know, yeah. who am I? What am I doing here? Instead of just sort of reacting to the universe around us and, and just conforming to everybody else's expectations, yeah. really getting clear on who am I and, and, and what's the good life and how do I live that. Uh, I really appreciated that. And we watched this movie called I Heart Huckabees, which yeah. was really kind of amusing as well. Um, so yeah, and she was also just in that very uh, kind of radical political camp right. as well that I appreciated. Yeah. I'm trying to think of others. I think, I, I mean, it was really Mr. Dodds. And then, I, and then after that, I noticed that a lot of the, the teachers around here were kind of radical people. It, if it weren't for the staff here and how kind you guys were to me and how, as cliche as it is to say, how much you believed in me. Like I certainly, like I said, grade eight was the worst year of my life. Grade nine wasn't much better. Um, I didn't like myself, I didn't like much at all, yeah. but people were so kind to me here. And I don't know why, because I was hard to be around. Mm -hmm. You got me when I was finally very studious, but mm -hmm. I was tough until mm -hmm. Oh, I heard stories. Yeah. <laughs> so honestly, I think if it weren't for teachers, and like Allie was a big, a big part of this. Yeah, Mrs. Hoffman. Mrs. Hoffman. Yeah. Um, I would have probably ended up in prison, and, and could have for certain things that I did when I was in grade eight and nine, if people hadn't gone to bat for me for what seemed to me like good no good reason like they didn't have very much reason to believe in me at that point mm -hmm. so I mean so now I've I've gone off I like myself I think the world's yeah. better for having me yeah. in it and that's pretty stark contrast yeah. to I could have gone to well, prison. Well who came up to you and said hey John I think you should be in the challenge program somebody must have put that into your ear like if you weren't yeah. going down that path yourself well, that was kind of a funny story. So that I uh, so I was sort of on the one track, the evil, the the yeah, dark the side. Dark side. <laughs> um, and then I had this girlfriend who she was my first girlfriend ever, and she just completely broke my heart. And I thought, man, this lifestyle hasn't really gotten me very far because my friends they're not really friends. They're more like lackeys, and they're kind of scared of me, and they follow me, but they turn on me, you know. And and fair enough if you know if the circumstances were right and then my girlfriend who I really cared about she cheated on me and then dumped me for another one of my friends so I was just like you know what this is not getting me very far uh, I didn't really know what else to do so I started doing homework and uh, it was also a good anesthetic because I just didn't want to feel what I was feeling right. and so homework would keep me busy and then I just asked for more homework and then yeah. give me more homework and then we had um, an interim teacher she was she was here for Miss Hope her name was Miss Steele and she was an English teacher yeah. and I was writing you know just doing all my homework for her and she was like John why aren't you in the challenge program and I was like I'm not smart enough because I in grade 7 at Rock Heights I'd applied and they said nope you're not whatever enough to be in the gifted program mm -hmm. at Rock Heights. So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I guess I'm not clever enough. And then she said, well, I really think that you should reapply here. Right. So then I a did. A student teacher. Yeah, a student teacher. That is great. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that was a really big deal. So then, because yeah. um, I was getting the highest grades in all my classes in grade, like the normal program. Yeah. But then I thought, well, but the challenge people are just so smart. So then she said, I think you should get into that. Yeah. So then I did. And then I started getting the highest grades in all those classes. So I was, I was more clever than I'd given myself mm -hmm. credit for. And there was like class stuff too, right? Like my parents had never gone to university. And yeah. um, I think a lot of our students here in the challenge program, they come from sort of the better neighborhoods. And yeah. um, they have like social and cultural capital that, that working yeah. class students don't really have. So there's yeah. just things that I just didn't know about because that's not what we talked about at the dinner table if yeah. we sat down to dinner, yeah. right? So... Um, so I think that was a, a part of it as too. I had I had like the raw intelligence, which you guys recognized, but yeah. I didn't have that social and cultural capital. Right. Academically, I I was knocking it out of the park 
pretty consistently. It's funny though, I had imposter syndrome. So because of that, I think largely, well, there was some mental health stuff, but also like the class thing. I thought every time I wrote a test or a paper, I was gonna fail that one and I would be exposed as not clever and not belonging in the challenge program. Um, so I'd consistently get like 98, 100%, but I was terrified every single time I had to perform because uh, this would be the time when I don't knock it out of the park. Um, but that never, <laughs> that catastrophe never struck. But probably my fondest memory was, uh, was being elected valedictorian. I'd never considered myself well, I was giving the speech, but I'd never considered myself to be a super popular guy. I was My nose was in the books all the time, yeah. um, and I was never very gifted socially. I had pretty bad social anxiety, actually, um, so I kind of just avoided mm -hmm. people. Certainly never went to parties, yeah. um, but I, I was a great public speaker. Somehow, my social anxiety didn't feed into this one area where it yeah. should have been crippling, but yeah. wasn't. So we had to give speeches in the auditorium, and then... Yeah. They elected me as valedictorian, and then we went to uh, UVic for our graduation ceremony. And I had like this extended metaphor about Star Wars, mm -hmm. and people loved it. It was yeah. just hilarious. It was so I loved that. I just felt like I felt very, very much myself in yeah. that moment. Uh, yeah. And it would be probably a few years before I got back to that feeling of myself. Um, but it was sort of an early, an early indication of of what being authentic could be. That was yeah. an authentic moment. So I was going to be the Prime Minister of Canada and then decided, <laughs> <In my head. laughs> decided that I wanted to be a counselor and then I was also really into spirituality. So yeah. I, uh, I went to school and did a Master's in Social Work and a Master's in Divinity, which is like yeah. a pastoral yeah. pastoral preparation program. So that was cool. So that's, a fi that's five years of school and then I yeah. did it in three. So wow. I was pretty... I mean, then that was like two weeks ago that I graduated. So I'm pretty proud of that. I think that's a that's a great moment. That's sort of a culmination of a lot of great moments. Um, I, I'd say the other one, though, I've sort of mentioned it a couple times. The other one was overcoming like my social anxiety and yeah. and uh, and like super low self esteem. That was one that that was pretty crippling. So I, I did really well academically. That's not really a new thing, but but liking myself. That's yeah. a new thing, and that's yeah. probably my greatest achievement. That took a lot of work. That took walking across Spain on a pilgrimage, living in a monastery, hitchhiking across Canada, going to therapy, going to 12-step groups. I've been meditating for eight years. I've put a lot of work into, into you know, being and liking myself, and so that's, that's probably my greatest achievement. So I went through my undergrad at UVic. I studied history and politics because yeah. I wanted to be a lawyer. Then had sort of this conversion experience in the middle of that, where I realized that uh, I'd been chasing I'd been chasing happiness for a long time. And so I was actually a really gifted athlete before I got into the scholastic stuff. And then I was really good at school, um, and then got a full scholarship to go through UVic. Uh, and was doing some other things that I thought like women relationships sort of thought that would maybe make me happy and nothing ever worked I was very unhappy so I got into spirituality because I thought well they claim you know they've got a pretty good uh, diagnosis of the human condition you know like the Buddha said life is suffering but I can identify with that and he also said there's a way out of suffering so I thought okay I'll give this spirituality thing a shot um, so essentially I worked for a year after graduating from my undergrad and then uh, decided I needed to go on an epic kind of quest. So I went to Europe, uh, bought a one-way ticket, and thought, maybe I'll never come home. Maybe I'll become a monk. So I went over, visited monasteries, hung out with monks, hung out with friars, lived in monasteries. And part of that, uh, I decided I should walk a pilgrimage if I was going to be a pilgrim. So yeah. I walked across Spain, and that, uh, I think, was 31 days. It's like 800 wow. kilometers across Spain. Yeah. Um, and the whole, the whole thing was kind of just like a male. It was like eat, pray, love meets into the wild, this kind of <laughs> journey. And, yeah. and I, I guess I was looking for peace, yeah. something like that. And I caught glimpses of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was good for me to kind of get out of my bubble because I'd done a lot of things sort of based on fear. A lot of my life was governed by fear. Even my achievement was... What will happen if I fail? I won't. Yeah. I won't be loved. I won't be accepted. I yeah. won't be succeed. Discovered. Yeah, I'll be discovered. So um, I wanted. I wanted some kind of freedom, and yeah. I thought, you know, monks. They must be the ones to talk to. Pilgrims, yeah. friars, priests, abbots. I'll go in and talk to and live with them and pray and meditate. So 
So how long were you in Europe for doing these things? That that time I was there for six months. Yeah. Um, and then at the very end, and then I was celibate that entire time. And then at the very end of that, I met and fell in love with a Swedish girl, which yeah. was completely unplanned. Um, but she broke down my defenses, and then <laughs> I ended up going to Sweden. So I had been in a Christian monastery. I met her. Buddhist monastery after that. Then I ended up going to Sweden. Then I came home. She and I dated for like eight months. She came to Canada. And then I went back to Europe and spent a year there this time and then lived in a monastery for uh, longer. There were two that, that I really liked. One was a Buddhist one called Plum Village where Thich Nhat Hanh lives. Um, and the other one is a Christian one called the Tizé community in the east of France. And both of them have very simple lifestyles. Um, there's a lot of chanting, a lot of meditating. They're in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a beautiful, simple life where there's no... Mm -hmm. this, I get caught up in so much bullshit. We all get caught up in so much bullshit. Mm -hmm. And there it's just you go, you pray, you work, you spend time with your friends, you're kind and you welcome the people who come to live there. Mm -hmm. You go to sleep and you repeat it. And it sounds like it would be super boring, but it was super, super satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so there was a long time where I thought I was supposed to be a monk. I had a monastic calling and yeah. that's why I spent so much time there and then eventually decided I wanted to come back. Kids and, and a wife. Yeah. So, so part of part of my journey when I went out east is kind of ironic when I went out to study spiritual care and, and mm -hmm. counseling and psychotherapy. Um, but I decided I'm going to get good at talking to women. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got really good at talking to women because, you know, like when I put my mind to something and yeah. study about it and learn about it, I get good at that. You knock it so, out of the park. <laughs> so I did that and then I knocked that out of the park. But I ended up like hurting people. I ended up hurting people and using people because, like I said, I'd always felt bad about myself. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, I'll rope people in and, and that'll bolster me. And like, you know, the popular guys at Esquimalt High, they always had these beautiful women around. And I was always off in the corner, you know, just studying. I want to be like those guys. Two years later of this, I was like, I don't want to be like those guys. Yeah. That's, that's really no way to be. And then actually somebody ended up breaking my heart. Uh, and I was like, that's how that feels. That is yeah. not nice. Yeah. So, uh, so I, yeah, I'm taking this year just to uh, essentially face my, I mean, this, the spiritual journey is like layers of an onion, right? And you, yeah. you take one layer off, there's another. So this is a, another layer of facing myself because I've tended to use relationships as a way yeah. to kind of numb myself to the pain of being human because it's hard to yeah. be alive. Yeah, and just to look at yourself in the mirror. Yeah, exactly. And like I, I never drank, I never did drugs, I, I don't eat sugar, I don't shop, I don't play video games, don't watch TV. Like essentially a Boy Scout, but there was this one kind of this relational piece mm -hmm. which I was using to avoid myself. Yeah. Um, and that's socially accepted though, right? That's why I was getting pats on the back for that thinking, oh, there's no problem yeah. here. But it's the same, I could, might as well have been a boozer, you know, yeah. drinking alcohol. There's nothing that somebody can come to me with that I could possibly judge them for because I yeah. have made so many mistakes yeah. all in the service of trying to be happy, right? Yeah. I, was, I was never trying to be a jerk. Yeah. And these people who come to see me, they were never trying to be jerks. Um, and that's an important lesson for sure because if I just coasted through life, it would be pretty easy to judge people. Oh. I made a lot of decisions based on fear, like I said. That was kind of the big motivating force. And I think a lot of us do have fear, fear of pain, fear of loss, fear of failure. Um, I think if you look at our society, that's what's driving a lot of people. Um, so I think we have a choice in the decisions that we make. We can do something for fear, or we can do something for love. And I would say, as cliche as that sounds, you know, act based on love, act based on who you are, be authentic. Um, because I made all these decisions based on fear, and it was just, it was hard. It never, it never did what I wanted to do, and I still hurt. Life's just painful, right? So I think, um, I think choose love probably would be the advice that I would That's give. A great advice. I, I couldn't disagree with a single thing you just said. Perfect. Yeah.